Hi, Prime Minister. Pleasure to welcome you to Canada, and thank you so much for uh, your time today. Well, the pleasure is mine. This is the first time a Greek Prime Minister has visited Canada in almost 41 years, in, f in four yeah. decades. Why now? Well, it's been a long time. I guess that's one, um, uh, you know, one good reason. Uh, you know, we're very close partners. Uh, we work together on, uh, on numerous uh, geopolitical issues. But I think this is the right time to further strengthen our economic uh, ties. Uh, as you know, Greece has been, uh, you know, um, uh, making a, I think, a rather impressive comeback uh, economically. We've left the crisis here behind us, uh, and I feel this is a good time to make the case also to the Canadian business community that they should uh, take a, you know, a good look at Greece and consider deploying capital there. I do want to talk about the economic relationship and those economic ties, and in particular, zero in on the trading relationship, especially to start off with, with respect to CETA, mm -hmm. uh, the free trade agreement between the EU mm -hmm. and Canada. There's been some big stumbling blocks lately, lately namely just a few days ago, the Senate in France uh, voted against ratifying it. Mm -hmm. When will Greece ratify CETA? Well, we hopefully will um, hopefully we'll ratify it. Uh, soon we'll still have some outstanding issues regarding you know some products uh, uh, whose geographical origin um, uh, uh, or particular nature we protect, such as uh, feta, for example. We want to make sure that feta cheese, uh, when it is sold in Canada, is the actual feta cheese, uh, and uh, you know only Greece uh, technically has the right um, uh, to to produce feta. But I think once these issues are uh, going to be sorted out, you know we'll be very very happy. Uh, to ratify the agreement. Uh, in f principle, I'm very much in favor of, uh, of these types of free trade agreements, uh, although I understand that there are some difficulties with, with other countries. But we'll sort out our, uh, you know, our differences. You are, though, as you said, you are in principle supportive of CETA. And the reason I ask very specifically is because there is growing sentiment in uh, certain aspects of other countries, particularly in the case of France, for example, from farmers, about liberalized trade and negative impacts that they perceive no, I, of it. You, no, you're not I, I, you know, in, in principle, I think uh, that if, if we wanted to, to sort out issues which are sensitive uh, to all involved parties, free trade agreements uh, work for everyone. But again, for example, we have a very you know, sensitive issue when it comes to you know, products uh, which are of Greek origin, uh, which uh, according to European law, only Greece can produce. Uh, and we feel that the same sort of rules need to apply uh, within the context of a free trade agreement. So uh, particular sensitivities need to be taken into, uh, into consideration. And do you anticipate that the issues that, that you're referencing will be resolved anytime soon? And the reason I ask is you had a minister here last year and the year before. He, he made the same comment, essentially. Once those are resolved, we remain in support and we will ratify. But that was Well, let's hope, let's hope that's uh, going to be one of the issues I'll discuss with the Prime Minister. But again, I don't want this to monopolize uh, uh, our agenda. We have a very broad uh, agenda. And I do need to point out that uh, um, Canadian companies have been active investors uh, in Greece and they actually invested uh, during uh, the financial crisis. So if they did so during the financial crisis, there is an additional reason why they would do so uh, um, much more uh, right now. You talked about um, renewables and, and sources of energy, and I know that's been an especially pertinent discussion in Europe ever since Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the transition away from Russian gas. We've had other European leaders here in Canada say if it were more available to them, they would be interested in Canada's LNG, liquefied of natural course. gas. Is that the same for that's you? That's the same for Greece. So uh, we are uh, a big entry point for LNG, not just for the Greek market, but also uh, for the Balkans, uh, for Eastern Europe. Theoretically, we could even supply Ukraine. Uh, we have a floating storage and regasification unit up in northern Greece, which is coming online. And of course, the point of this infrastructure is not just to serve the Greek market, but also to serve uh, our neighbors uh, towards the north. So in principle, yes, we are very interested in obtaining uh, LNG at competitive prices. Uh, as fast as we go in terms of our renewable penetration, we will still need uh, a reliable source of electricity. And for us, for Greece, we don't have uh, nuclear. We're, we've practically moving away, completely moving away from coal. So that leaves uh, natural gas for the foreseeable future uh, as uh, a significant uh, source of uh, um, uh, energy uh, for the production of electricity. Is Canada, uh, given the current geopolitical status of things, an ideal partner in that, do you think? Could be an ideal partner? Abs uh, you know, uh, absolutely. Uh, and uh, uh, again, uh, Canada is, uh, is a country which we share, you know, so many, so many values. And again, as I pointed out at the beginning, uh, the the Greek Canadian community serves as a natural um, uh, bridge between our um, uh, two countries. Uh, uh, so uh, we're, we're cooperating with uh, with Canada on you know geopolitical issues, you know Ukraine, 
uh, Gaza, I think we see eye to eye uh, on many of the challenges that we face. And of course, it is up to the liberal democracies of the West to ensure that we have a common front uh, against the Russian uh, aggression. And Canada is an indispensable partner in this effort. I want to ask about that front because right from the start, Greece has been unequivocally supportive of Ukraine. You recently traveled to Odessa and there was a series of, you know, very troubling things that, that happened while you were there. Did that experience change or, or impart anything on your view of what's happening and what has to happen in response to Russia's I think aggression? It, I think it reinforced my belief that we need to support Ukraine in order to help the Ukrainians defend themselves. Uh, I mean, and it is it's very clear that uh, uh, we need to do more um, uh, in terms of assistance. We've made it very clear uh, to the Ukrainians that we want to help. They know what we can do and what we cannot do. And the same is true for uh, many other uh, European countries. And one of the topics that we are discussing at the European Council is how, we can, how can we help Ukraine um, uh, sort of uh, make sure that they have the necessary equipment to defend themselves. For example, we've made pledges regarding shells um, uh, because they are short of artillery shells and we need to make sure that we help them. Uh, in that uh, direction. But once you go to Ukraine, especially in Odessa, uh, you, you understand that for us it may be just a few hours in what is a war zone. And we actually had a sort of rather troubling experience of uh, uh, witnessing a, a missile explosion not too far from where we were in the Odessa port. But for those people, this is their everyday uh, reality. And we have an obligation uh, as uh, liberal Western democracies to stand up against aggression and to make it very clear that any change of border uh, through um, uh, violence can in principle not be accepted. Europe is very unified to a large degree on this issue. There is a large amount of aid currently stuck in the United States. How concerning is that to you? It is concerning and I do hope that uh, uh, the US Congress is going to resolve this issue. We did our part and I think we're also sending a signal um, to the US that uh, they also need to um, uh, uh, sort of um, overcome all these, uh, you know, sometimes procedural delays and, and deliver uh, when it comes to financial um, uh, assistance. Uh, it, it also took us some time, but we managed to reach a unanimous agreement um, uh, to support um, Ukraine with 50 uh, billion euros over the next five, uh, four years. This is a significant amount of money uh, that uh, keeps uh, the Ukrainian uh, uh, economy functioning. And I would hope that the U.S. takes note of what has happened in, uh, in Europe and that will, they will also step up to the plate and deliver the necessary assistance as soon as possible. Greece, the U.S., Europe and Canada are all key members, obviously, of, of NATO as well, which factors into this aspect of, of the discussion. Uh, there is a lot of conversation in this country about defense spending targets. Your country exceeds NATO's defense spending target currently. Does that target matter in your view? Of course, it does matter. Uh, we are spending, and we've been spending ever since we joined NATO, more than 2% uh, of our GDP on defense. We have done it because we have our particular geographical and geopolitical challenges. Uh, but it is important for all other countries to reach a 2% target uh, as quickly as possible. And especially for European um, uh, countries, uh, I think it is imperative. Um, to send a signal that we will be able to defend ourselves and that we need to spend not just more but also to be able to be smarter in terms of our defense spending and this of course also uh, relates to um, being able to streamline uh, you know procurement rules when it comes to um, uh, defense purchases it means better cooperation amongst our European defense uh, industries but at the end of the day NATO is only as strong as the sum of its parts uh, and the more every single country spends on defense, the stronger NATO will be. You mentioned the imperative for Europe. Does the imperative in your view also exist for Canada? Because Canada does not yet even have a plan to get to 2%. I think that uh, every NATO country should get to 2% as quickly as possible. Uh, and of course, I, uh, I do uh, understand there's always a temptation, you know, um, uh, not to spend money on defense and spend it uh, on uh, um, uh, on, on other priorities, but you know, in our case, we never had that luxury. Uh, we always spend more than two percent on defense, and then we also had to make sure we found enough money uh, for all other uh, budgetary uh, items. Uh, but to the extent that this is a collective goal, 
uh, of the NATO uh, alliance. I think it is important for all countries uh, to reach that goal. Okay, I'll leave it on that note. Prime Minister, I'm out of time. Eferisto Poli. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.